So far you've learned about facies and environments on carbonate ramps and carbonate platforms and in reefs. All those environments are typical warm water carbonate settings, but it turns out that carbonates can actually form outside of the tropics as well. So this video introduces some basic differences between typical tropical carbonates and what are called cool water carbonates, like this bryzo and rich limestone here. So as I said, carbonates can form in cool water environments. They can even form in polar environments near active ice sheets. This section here is from the lower Permian of Tasmania, and it contains a variety of shell-rich and, and muddy limestones, but those carbonates also contain granitic boulders and other rocks dropped from icebergs. In fact, the large angular drop stone that I've marked there is within a limestone bed, and it's in fact crushing carbonate-producing organisms like bryozoans. So it's, it's a very unusual and extreme carbonate environment. So as you learned before, this, the classic idea of a carbonate environment is a, is a tropical, warm water, clear, beautiful marine setting. And these classic carbonates contain abundant abiotic precipitates or inorganic precipitates like ooids or micrite. Uh, they're dominated by aragonitic organisms like green algae. And so because photosynthetic or, or at least symbiotic organisms are the dominant producers of skeletal fragments in these settings, these typical warm water carbonates have been given the name photozoan carbonates. In contrast, um, cool water carbonates lack these abiotic precipitates, so ooids, micrite, peloids are, are absent. The photosynthetic and the symbiotic organisms are also absent, or at least very rare, and allochems are instead dominated by calcitic shell fragments from heterotrophic animals. So heterotrophic means that they derive nutrients from eating other plants or animals, and most of them are, are filter feeders. They filter out plankton from the water. So because heterotrophs dominate and photosynthetic organisms are rare, these cool water carbonates are called heterozoan carbonates. So this diagram shows the distribution of a variety of allochem types, mostly different types of skeletal fragments, in heterozoan and photozoan carbonates. And some are broken down, separating Paleozoic from Mesozoic or Cenozoic categories. Don't worry about the details, you don't need to know which groups are dominant in, in different uh, types of carbonates. But the key point is that basically the more complex an animal is, the more likely it is to be able to produce carbonate in a variety of conditions, including heterozoan conditions. So things like Animals like brachiopods or bivalves or barnacles, bryozoans, they're fairly complicated animals. They can make heterozoan carbonates. But simpler animals like corals or sponges um, you know, maybe are less able to control their calcification, and so they don't really occur in heterozoan carbonates. Um, and then single-celled foraminifera or, or, or algae are also more likely to be restricted to this warm water environment. And abiotic precipitates like ooids or peloid or, or micrite are sort of the extreme case where the calcification is purely inorganic and so they're restricted to these warm photozoan carbonates where the saturation state is, is very high. So note that temperature is not the only control on photozoan and heterozoan carbonates. Nutrients are also important. So as nutrient levels increase from low nutrient oligotrophic towards high nutrient eutrophic settings, photozoan organisms like cor colonial, or these hermatypic corals, as well as red algae tend to decrease in abundance, while heterozoan groups like bryozoans and barnacles increase in abundance. The reason for this is that photozoan organisms get their energy from sunlight, and so they don't do as well as heterotrophic organisms when the nutrient levels are high. High nutrient levels means more food for the heterozoan organisms, so they're better able to compete with these photozoan groups. So finally, the lack of aragonite in heterozoan carbonates actually has some pretty important implications for the behavior of the sediment during burial. So this process, the processes of physical and chemical changes that occur after deposition are grouped as something called diagenesis. Normally, aragonite in the sediment, because it's metastable at these surface conditions, may dissolve during the early parts of diagenesis. So what this does is it raises saturation state in the pore water, ultimately leading to the formation of early diagenic cements. 
But because heterozoan carbonates lack aragonite, these early cements just don't form, and actually the grains are instead compacted mechanically and they get sutured together. So this has important implications for porosity in these, these carbonates, in, in that cool water carbonates typically lack a lot of porosity that you might find in the warm water or the photo, photozoan carbonates.